Don't do anything till Jesus says, I told you, once it's on, it's on, you're out. So if you were putting stuff underneath your seat, you're out. Jesus said, stand up if you're left, except for Spanky who talks, because you don't get to talk. Oh, by the way, anybody know the, the name of the president that's on the $20 bill? Nobody else speak out. Anybody know? You already have Bible? <laughs> Sid, are you in? Sorry? No, you're not. You're out. I didn't ask you that. Sit down. There we go. Good. Anybody, anybody standing? No. Wait a minute. You're not a camper. You drove up at night? Jesus said, did you drive up at night? Your, your brother drove? Where's your brother? Sit down. You're done. Okay. Good. Anybody know? Okay. Anybody standing? No, and you have to raise your little fat hand. Don't just speak out. <laughs> Anybody know the name of the president on the $20 bill? Jesus said, if you know that answer, raise your hand. I saw a hand going back there. Willie? Her? No, you sit down and ask you twice. But I said, standing. You kind of already got it. <laughs> Anybody else standing? Jesus said, anyone else standing know the president on the $20 bill? Raise your hand. So you haven't seen 20 bucks in your whole entire life. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Jesus said, go ahead. No, ma'am. That's okay. And I won't kick you out for getting it wrong. That's the $1 bill. That's the one we see the most. Okay, the winner get No, Bob, you're out, so put your hand down. <laughs> okay, good. Now, you'll notice there's not a whole lot left. Not a whole lot left. I'll tell you, it is Andrew Jackson. Now, Jesus said, does anybody know the name of the president on the $50 bill? That's tomorrow night. $50 bill. Who is standing? Bob. <laughs> Anybody know? Raise your hand if you know. Jesus said, if you know, raise your hand if you know who's on the $50 bill. Didn't know the 20, so I don't know why I'm even asking. Okay. <laughs> well, tomorrow night, whoever wins gets the 50 bucks. But tonight is $20. Are you ready, standing people? Who said it's ready? <laughs> Who said they're ready? Oh, <laughs> you need 20 bucks, sir? <laughs> You do? <laughs> Must be married. <laughs> I got you. Okay, what, Anthony? No, what's the dude just came in? Anthony. Is it Anthony? Okay, don't even stand up because you're already out. Okay, good. <laughs> That's good. Tanner, what are you drinking? <laughs> you need the energy to keep going? Is that how it works? <laughs> All right, here we go. Jesus said, put your hand in the air like this. Jesus said, put your palm over, put your palm back this way. <laughs> Did you put your palm over, Tanner? <laughs> you <don't know. laughs> I give up. <laughs> okay, good. Who that? He's gone. Yes, I know he's gone, sweetheart. <laughs> Just like you. <laughs> he's gone. Put your arm out like that. Really. Jesus said, put your arm out like that. Very good. All right. Jesus said, what's your name? Ma'am? Ma oh, didn't ask you twice. You know, I'm sorry. That's terrible. <laughs> I love being rotten. It's just so enjoyable. Teenagers, you torment us. And this is called, you reap what you sow. <laughs> All right, Jesus said, put your arm down. Jesus said, put one hand up like that. Jesus said, move your hand. Now, if you go too slow, you're gone. Okay, you're almost too slow. So watch it. Because I'm watching you. Wait, is your arm getting tired? Jesus said, go faster. Jesus said, go really fast. Stop. Anybody flinch? I didn't see it. No? Josiah, Jesus said, take one step that way. You're like Mr. Popular. <laughs> and, and I don't mean to hurt you, son. So don't keep wiggling your hand. 
<laughs> hold, hold your arm up a little higher. Now listen to me. You're not that good looking, okay? <laughs> now if you said that to a girl, she'd go to the bathroom and throw up, but we won't go into all that kind of stuff. Okay? Y'all should see it from my angle. <laughs> see Spaggy over here. He, he, he's going through a breathing process because the blood is coming out of his hand now. She said, put your hand down. She said, put both arms up like this, palms up. She said, palms up. She said, palms down. Now palms up, now palms down. <laughs> quit smiling. Jesus said, quit smiling. Don't smile again the rest of the time or you're out of here, oh. Jesus said. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus said, you two ladies come up here. <laughs> Jesus said, you stand there. Jesus said, you stand there. Turn, turn this way a little bit. Jesus said, turn this way a little bit. What are you, looking for a performance or something? <laughs> Not toward me. Turn even. This way. Jesus said, turn even this way. Jesus said, "You, what's your name again?" Jesus said, "What's your name?" Sarah. Sure. Are you punching your drawing, Sarah? Jesus said, "Sarah, turn around and face." Jesus said, "What's your name?" Jacqueline. Jacqueline. <laughs> Couple of scary women up here. Right? <laughs> Jacqueline. Jacqueline. <laughs> 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 And Jesus said, put your arms down. <coughs> All right, here we go. Go to two for a while. Winter green. Kodiak, winter green. No, never mind. We don't want to go Jesus said, take one step forward each other. That's too big. Where's your shoes? I wonder what smell. Okay, we're good. All right. Are we like related to a lizard? What's in this song? <laughs> you got cotton map? What have you been doing, girl? What's going on? <laughs> I can't look at that. <laughs> like watching, a, watching a white girl version of a kiss concert. I mean, like, I mean, like, Shake it. <laughs> <laughs> look at her. Oh, you looked. Oh, no, you looked. You go, you, your little eyeball went. <laughs> Sorry, Sarah, but you're gone. You are gone, Sarah. <laughs> Jesus said, take it and get away from me. <laughs> All right, Romans chapter 14, please, tonight. Is that your book, Mark? All right, here we go. All campers, sit up straight. Go leaning over and put your own fat face in your hands. None of that stuff. Sit up straight like good little boys and girls. Give me a few minutes. You know when a preacher says, I'm just going to take a few minutes, you know he's lying. So I'm going to take an hour just to show you. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, that's right, please. One guy, and he's a liar. <clears throat> okay, good. Romans chapter 14, verse number 12, please, tonight. Now, let us stand together, please. Can you stretch your kneecaps one more time? Those of you not out, we're out of the bed. <laughs> stand up. Romans chapter 14. We're going to look at one verse. It's a long verse, but I hope you can stay with me. It's verse 12. <coughs> Excuse me. Romans 14, verse 12. Find it. Look at me. I want to talk to you about biblical truths that no one can change. Biblical truths that no one can change. So anything the Bible says is true, no one can change that. I agree with that. But here's the thing. Every one of these things, you're going to know what they are. It's not like I'm going to 
teach you some new truth. Anybody tries to break new truth on you, they always get in trouble. Yeah. Always. Yeah. There's an old preacher years ago, Lester Roloff, said, if it's new, it's not true. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's fascinating. It was raining pretty hard a little bit ago. Yeah. And people were looking out the window like, it's raining. <laughs> <laughs> like you've never seen rain before. Remember last year? Okay. The truth of the matter is, these things are, they're incontrovertible. That means nothing can ever change them. Now, here's why, here's why that's important to you. Because for you, young people, you need to get this in your mind, these simple things I'm going to give you tonight. And understand this, whether we agree with it or not, believe it or not, think it'll happen to me or not, whatever the case may be, it will take place. It is true. Because God's word said so. I wish we could get back to simple faith and believe that if God says it, that's it. Mm. Now, I know that because of the super highway of information known as the Internet. Now we have all kinds of stuff. We have the God of Google to compete with the word of God. And it has no place of competition. Right. Absolutely none. That's right. I don't care what you see, what you saw, what you read, who you looked up, how many times you studied something out, how many places you went to on the internet. If it against the word of God, it's wrong. God's right. Amen. Amen. Now, if we could settle that in our minds, your life and my life would be a lot more simple. If you think about it, come on, people, look at me. If you think about it, our lives, everybody has a phone. How many, how many ha don't have a cell phone? You don't have one. God bless you. My, get a picture of that. Is that on video? I'm going to take that with me everywhere in the country. I know people who've got four-year-olds who've got phones. They text their kids in the bedroom to come to dinner. Everywhere you go, people got one of those stupid things. I have one. You, some of you have one. Truth of the matter is, this information that we get today, if we're not careful, the Bible becomes another source of information. It's not a source of information. It is the truth. Yes. Yeah. Jesus said, sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is truth. So if the Bible says it is, it is. If the Bible says it isn't, it isn't. If the Bible says it's right, it's right. If the Bible says it's wrong, it's wrong. That's it. Now, if we could get that in our heads tonight and have that mentality when we come to the Bible. See, that's not what I always believed. You're talking, you look at an old hippie from the 60s. I was raised in a public school. <clears throat> And was taught all kinds of foolishness. My uh, entire junior year of English in high school, well, one whole semester, was spent on this question. Now watch me. If a tree falls in the forest and no one's there to hear it, does it make a sound? A whole semester of the question. And you see, well... Brother Johnson, it doesn't matter. That's my answer. I'm sitting in class and the teacher asks, and she goes around the room and says, what do you think? What do you think? What do you think? What do you think? And you was it was amazing how juniors in high school could become so philosophical. Well, I mean, technically, blah, blah, blah. she comes to me, she goes, what do you think? I said, I don't care as long as I'm not standing under it. <laughs> and she said, that's a simplistic point of view. And I thought, thank God, I'm going to stay simplistic on this stuff. Come on, it's not like you're the first ones to ever be lied to, uh, confused, uh, misfed information, right, told right. things that are just flat, not true, and contrary to God's word. But Brother Perry said it a little bit ago, and I hope you picked up on this. It doesn't make a difference what your generation is. See, we think, uh, our, us older people, we think, man, these kids, you got stuff to deal with that we never even heard of. And that's true. But that doesn't mean it's more complicated for you. It means you need to look to the simple things and make it simple. There's a business axiom or a rule in a business called simplify, simplify, simplify. Hey, keep it simple. Preacher, yes, preacher was preaching at a guy's church and he got up to preach and on the pulpit there was a little, little uh, placard on the pulpit with th four letters. K period, I period, S period, S period. And that wasn't the band that Sarah was emulating a minute ago. <coughs> <coughs> kiss. And he thought, oh, his wife put that up there as a, you know, here's a kiss for my husband while he's preaching. He got done, he asked the preacher, he goes, does that, your wife put that up there? She goes, yeah. He goes, yeah, she did. He said, oh, and she offered you a kiss. He goes, no. K-I-S-S -S means keep it simple, stupid. <laughs> yeah. No, no, look at me. The more complex life gets, the more you need to look to the simple truths yes. 
to resolve the complexity of things. We make things more complicated. We got it all messed up now because we've turned away, the Bible said, turned our ears away from the truth and are turned unto what the Bible calls fables. You know what a fable is? It's a fictional story. So I'm going to give you a couple simple things today that are incontrovertible. It simply means this. Nothing's going to change them. And we need to accept that. Romans 14, verse 12. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Father, bless please tonight, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. <coughs> Unchangeable truth number one. Look at me. Look at me. Everybody. Unchangeable truth number one. Every one of us is going to answer to God. Every one of us. That means, listen now, you have a one-on-one -on -one appointment with the God of heaven. And you're going to stand before him. Now, there's two major judgments in the Bible. The great white throne judgment, where people stand there. They're judged according to their sin to determine their degree of punishment in hell. But that's a one-on-one -on -one judgment. By the way, in those judgments, nobody talks. God does all the talking. At the great white throne judgment, everyone who is judged there goes to hell when it's over. Everybody. The second judgment, major judgment, is called the judgment seat of Christ. That's the context of Romans 14. At the judgment seat of Christ, every saved person has a one-on-one -on -one appointment with Jesus. And you're going to stand in front of him and give account of yourself to God. Now look at me. He's not going to ask you, what did you do with your life? There's no talking. He does the talking. And the Bible says everything will be revealed. A couple other places in Scripture, 1 Corinthians 3 and 5, says that every one of us will give account of ourselves to God and that he will judge how we built our lives. You know what how implies in the Bible? Not only what you did, but look at me, why you did it. Wow. You ever watch somebody do something, you look at it and you go, that's, that's absolutely sloppy work. Mm. Or you watch someone do something and they get done, and you go, man, that is incredibly detailed. So the why was as, as relevant as the how. Okay? If you're saved, you're going to have that one-on-one -on -one with Jesus, and he is going to reveal, listen now, that judgment seat of Christ's uh, judgment is both collective and individual. That means this. All the saved are going to be standing there, and you're going to come up one-on-one -on -one and stand in front of Jesus, and he's going to show everybody the how of what you did. Now, sin is not judged. That's done at the cross. It's gone. But I'm talking about what you did from the time you were saved till that moment and the impact of it, and he's going to reveal why you did it. Now, since that is the case, first of all, I pray to God in heaven, you will not be at the judgment seat of Christ for judgment. Because yeah. if you are, you're going to hell when it's over, period. Revelation chapter 20, it's a done deal. That judgment is to determine degrees of punishment. These people who get away with stuff, nobody gets away with anything. They may get away with it with man's system of justice, and they may get away with, with the way do th they do things in their life, but when they face God, they're getting away with nothing, and they're going to answer for what they did and the impact of what they did. God helped people who start false religions to stand in front of God. Yeah. God helped people like these communist people, Mao and Stalin and these people who murdered millions of their own. Uh, Chairman Mao of China, he buried an entire regiment of his own army in the Gobi Desert alive. Tortured and murdered and starved millions of his own people. He's going to answer for every one of those, and his hell is going to cover eternity to make him pay for that. But now listen, if you're saved, you're not going there. But you are going to the judgment seat of Christ. Now look at me, look at me. Did you realize that if Jesus comes back tonight, trump of God sounds, dead in Christ, rise first. Yes, Methodists, go to heaven. We which are alive and remain are called up together. We meet the Lord in the air, and we all go to heaven, right? No, you go to the judgment seat of Christ. That means, look at me, you could face him tonight right. yeah. with your life. And the how and the why right. and the what. So, hey, young people, get off, get off the idea that somehow you got folks fooled about things. You got nobody fooled about anything. Right. Right. Yeah. Like you can fool me and us and everybody else and, you know, do the speeches and know how to say the words and all that. But the bottom line is, at that moment... Say, well, my, but my sin won't be judged. You're absolutely right, but there'll be nothing there. Do you realize from Adam, the first saved person, to the last one, is going to stand at that judgment seat of Christ, and it only takes seven years to do that one at a time. Mm 
Do you know why? Because it doesn't take long for a person to stand there. And Jesus said, reveal his life, reveal her life, enter in the joy of the Lord. Next, reveal it. Because a lot of people are, it's not what you come to the judgment seat of, with in your life that matters. It's what you leave with that matters. There's a ton of people do a ton of stuff. And they do it for self. They do it grudgingly. Huh? Why do you do what you do? Well, because I have to. That one's gone. I don't have to go to church. I don't have to read my Bible. I don't have to witness. I don't have to live for God. I don't have to do that. I don't have to do anything. I want to do that for him. That will last. So at the judgment seat of Christ, it takes seven years to judge all of the saved. That's millions of people, God willing. But it doesn't take long to say, okay, reveal her life. Oh, okay, nothing. Next. You still go to heaven, but you go to heaven with nothing. And just like a person who goes to hell to pay forever for their sins, you're going to live forever in heaven with what you take. Wow. So truth number one, look at me. We're all going to face God someday. So that means this. It's very simple. You better live every day like that's the day you're going to face God. So I'm driving out here on this road. and It's, uh, it's like going to a rodeo. From here back to uh, North Pole. And, I, pew, pew, pew. and if I drove slower, it'd probably be better, but I'm from California. I can be anywhere in America in 10 minutes. <laughs> There's a few times I got a little airborne in the truck. I mean, whoop, up on the, it says bumps, 30 miles an hour. I'm doing it 65. <laughs> and the road's wet like that, and I'm looking for moose. You know, I want to see. I saw one yesterday, thank God. If I'm looking for some moose and they're bouncing in the truck and flying around, I thought, whoa. <laughs> What happens if this thing just slides off the road and I go in a ditch and nobody out there and I'm dead? Too bad I ain't waiting. It totally changes your mentality. If I'm going to die, I want to die having done something for God. Not sitting there playing a stupid video game. Watching stuff on the internet and getting all caught up in something that just trapped. Some of you young people, listen to me carefully. You do not realize how addicted you are, how addicted you are to stuff you're looking at on the internet. I'm not just talking about bad, wicked porn stuff. I'm talking about junk that has just captivated your mind and your heart and your life. So no, it's not. Okay, prove it to me. Go home this week and don't touch anything like that for seven days and see if you can do it. You can't, you need to be, you'd be going through withdrawals and rolling around the ground and foaming at your mouth or having the tongue problem Sarah has. But the truth of the matter is, here you go. No, prove it. Right. Prove it. Hey, right. I, I look at me. I double stinking dog dare you. Yeah. Yeah. One of my teenage girls in our youth group got all caught up in this anime thing on, from Korea. And she said, Pastor, there's nothing. You know, and I thought, no, I don't even know what it is. So I, I had the youth guys look it up. It was preacher, it's not really very good. To be honest with you, it's not right at all. And we tried to talk her out of it. Here's what we, here's what we told her to do. Just go seven days and not look at that. Just seven days. She hasn't gone back to it since because she did not realize how much control it had over her in her life. Come on. Come on. We're going to give an account to God. Excuse me. You are going to give an account to God. I am going to give an account to God. You're not going to miss the day. Hey, look at me. When I say look at me, I mean look at me. You're not going to miss the day. Your day will come and you'll stand before God. Now, I... You say, well, you're trying to scare me, Brother Johnson. You stand in front of the Lord Jesus Christ and looking at the thorn scars in his brow and the nail prints in his hands and realizing you in front of all the saved of humanity are about to give an account of yourself to the Lord Jesus. That would put a little shake in your gizzard, pal. There's either, you either don't believe the Bible or there's something wrong with you. Yes, <laughs> you realize where <clears throat> the missionary he was talking about and that little girl and that little boy in that village that got saved, those people are going to be there. You're going to stand next to Apostle Paul. And, and the people of faith, you're going to be there. You're going to stand there with them. And then you're going to try to say, well, it was raining and I didn't feel good about myself. You know, it's really not going to hold too good. Right. When I was in the service there was, uh, in boot camp, they had me do something called guard duty. Potentially one of the dumbest things you ever have to do in the military. Because they want you to guard a barracks in case someone tries to steal it. <laughs> Two-story building with 55 guys in it. It ain't going anywhere. My day came. Let's stand our feet and stretch your kneecaps. My day came. 
after uh, 19 hours of KP. <coughs> it's called Kitchen Police. They march you at 3 in the morning to the other side of the base, and you <laughs> run the chow hall for somebody else's outfit. And you clean and scrub and feed and cook and clean and scrub and feed and cook for three meals. You get back to your barracks about 10, 11 o'clock that night. After you've been up since 3 in the morning, you're stinking wore out. Get back to the barracks. Everyone's ready to hit the rack, man. I mean, it's time to go. And I sit on my bed, the drill sergeant walks and goes, Johnson! Guard duty! And I said, I ain't doing it. I don't, don't want to do it. I'm sorry. My knee hurts and I got a boo-boo on my finger and everything else. Yeah. You change your clothes and you go do guard duty. What do you do? You go downstairs, two store of barracks, old World War II barracks. You go downstairs, you stand next to the door, and the door's got two panes of glass in it. And you stand right inside those panes of glass, and you stand there at parade rest for four hours. Now you can walk around every now and then and make sure that the, the place is not on fire. <laughs> Man, I'm standing there, I was so stinking tired. I kept walking around trying to stay awake. It was not working. If you ever get so tired, you just talk yourself into something. Yeah. And all of a sudden, I look at those stairs that are right there going to the second floor. Look like a water bed, man. Oh, no. Nice, comfortable mattress with sheets and blankets. I'm so tired, I thought, you know what? If you sleep on guard duty, they'll throw you in the brig. That's Joe. And at least I can get some sleep. <laughs> I mean, you get wacko when you get that tired. I tried, I tried, I tried, I tried. Finally, I just said, throw me in jail. I can't take it. And I laid down on the stairs, right with the window right there. I don't know how long I lay there. <coughs> Suddenly there was a burning sensation. Fortunately, it was not the barracks on fire. It was a drill sergeant from the next outfit standing in the window looking at me. And I looked up and went, oh no. <laughs> Jumped back in position. And he's right here on the other side of that window, smoking bear hat. And he's just staring at me with this smirk on his face. <laughs> well, I stood there, my heart's pounding. I'm saying, come on, man. Just throw me in jail. Get it over with. I don't know how long he stood there. It seemed like days. It wasn't. And then he just walked off. I thought he went to get help to kill me. <laughs> I did my watch. I did the next guy's watch. <laughs> my heart was pounding. I was not sleeping. Next morning, fall out! We get out in our formation. We line up like that. And we're standing there. Everybody, you know, dress, 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 dress. Boom. And all of a sudden, I see him in the corner of my eye. And I look over there. And there he is. <laughs> That same drill sergeant with the smoky bear hat. And he's standing right here. He said, Johnson? <laughs> yep. Sir, yes, sir. He goes, having a nice morning? <laughs> said, no, sir, no, sir. He goes. <laughs> and he walked off. I thought, you. Well, I won't say what I saw. I said, yeah, you can't believe that. The dude's going to wait. And he did. The next day, same date, same thing, same dude, same. How's it going today, Johnson? <coughs> terrible, sir. Absolutely terrible. He goes, have a nice day. And he walked off. Four and a half weeks. I see this man in our area. I'd be walking along. And here he come. And he had a smoky bear head down. He'd look up and he'd go. <laughs> and he walked right past me. And about two weeks of that, I wanted to say, kill me! I can't say that anymore, kill me! The dude tortured me for four and a half weeks. He never said a word. Look at me. God is my judge. Every time I pass a bush, I kept expecting him to jump out and get me. And that was 1971? He's out there somewhere I know he is. He's going to jump out and drag me to jail. It's coming. Not the drill, sir. <laughs> it's coming. Be seated. Turn your Bibles, please, to Matthew 6 and verse 24. Un incontrovertible truths. Number one, we're all appear before God. Everybody. <coughs> Man, I wish a couple of below would get over. Matthew 6 and verse 24. Here's another truth incontrovertible truth. See, I don't like you, Brother Johnson. You picked on something I love. I'm not trying to pick on you. I'm just trying to help you to understand something. 
we don't realize how much this world infects and affects us right. in our minds, and we don't see it. The Bible tells us to be that Satan is very deceptive, yep. and to beware, be, beware lest you're, you're you're hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Mm, right. So we're not we're not careful. We'll think, well, he just doesn't understand. I, I don't have to understand when something's not right. You got to get it right. And one day we're going to sit, stand in front of God, and then it's going to matter a bunch, and let's go ahead and act now like we want to stand there someday. No one's going to stand in front of God and say, I am man, perfect, I did everything. No one's going to do that. But every day of our life should be lived in the reality. See, look, look, I, I won't be home for two weeks. This week I'm gone. I get fly home uh, uh, Friday. I get home like 8 o'clock to the airport in Sacramento. It's 150 miles away. Next morning, 6 o'clock, i got to get on an airplane, fly to Massachusetts and start revival meetings. I'm there till Wednesday. So I won't be home for two weeks. I'll be in hotels or the nice place, Brother Murray's place, that kind of thing. I mean, it's just me, right? Look at me. No, it's not just me. It's not only not my life. I'm, I'm not my own. I bought with a price. It's not just me. Right. Why would I want to throw something away for so simply? I, want to, I realize that God watches me. The eyes of the Lord in every place beholding the evil and the good. Oh, the book of me. No, it's not the book. It's called God. And he watches us because he wants to watch over us to be careful. But he's also watching what you do. You're never alone. Yeah. Right. There is no private stuff. Right. Yeah. An answer to God. Let me move up quickly. Now. Go to verse 24, Matthew 6. No man can serve two masters. Again, this is Jesus talking. So that settles the fact that this is the way it is. No man can serve two masters, for either he, he will hate the one and love the other. Notice that, please. The master you choose, because that's what he's saying. He's not saying you might have one. He said everyone has at least one, but you can't serve two. And he says that when you choose your master, you're going to hate the one and love the other. Now look at me. I believe that's a bit extreme, wouldn't you say? He didn't say you're going to kind of like this one and you're not going to kind of like that one. He says you're going to hate one of them and you're going to love the other one. Keep going, verse 24. Or else he will hold to the one. That means hold on to it tightly and despise the other one. You cannot serve God and man, but man just simply his riches and possessions and stuff. There's nothing wrong with being, being wealthy. As I told you the other day, I don't, even, I don't know any lazy rich people. Never met one. They're all hardworking people. God's not against riches. He's not against accumulating stuff. He's against you making that your goal. Right. But what he's simply saying is this, Josiah. He's saying you're going to have, you do have one master. Everybody has a master. <coughs> master is, in, in the Bible, it means your Lord. The supreme authority he talked about, that, that the authority that's in the soil that goes into the tree. And everybody has a master. Uncontrovertible truth. You have a master. That's right. You choose him. Yes. This is not like a master-slave thing where you have no choice. This is a master you choose to have as the authority in your life. Watch. And if that master you choose, you're going to love him and hold on to him. And the other master, you're going to hate him and despise him. So we wonder why sometimes teenagers, they got that look on their face like, I hate this, but I hate everything about this, but I don't like, I don't like you, I don't like this, I don't like that. Uh, you're telling me who your master is. Wow. But young people, look at me. But you choose the master you have. I did the thing in the 60s when I was a teenager and told you I played basketball with Abraham Lincoln. I got you. Okay, good. But in the 60s, I, I chose a master to let the world tell me how to live my life. Live for the approval of what was out there because, you know, like most teenagers, you want to fit in. But Daniel didn't want to fit in. By himself, as a teenager, he purposed to not defile himself against the world's greatest empire. Joseph was a teenager. He purposed to keep himself right. So it's not like it can't be done. I don't have anybody to go with me. I watched some of you when you're when we're singing. Some of you, you, you look at the person next to you to see if they're singing before you sing. Yeah. Wow. Invitation time comes. You don't think about going to the altar or kneeling or something. You look this way, you look that way. You got a master. Yeah. You're letting you're letting the people who are your friends be your master. Wow. Good news about this master thing. <clears throat> you get the wrong one, you can get the right one. Yeah. One of those things they taught me in public school was 
Henry David Thoreau, no bother reading it, it's junk. Every man marches to the beat of a different drummer. And you need to march to that drummer in your life. Whatever, frozen, whatever you think in your heart, you watch that kind of stuff, you're outside your cotton picking mind. Disney's been in the toilet for years. You're right. You're watching that kind of stuff. You don't need, don't you see what they're doing? Don't you? See, I started to watch it because I heard about it. I, I've got about two minutes into it. I thought this is junk, man. <laughs> because you know why? You just go with your heart and how you feel. The heart and heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? If it feels good to you and it's right, then it's right, and that's how you live. What? That's not Bible. You. You're choosing the master. To tell you that you are your own God. Let me see. Where did that start? That started uh, 6,000 years ago. Garden yeah, of Eden. Right. Yeah. Serpent. Has God said. By the way, young people, look at me. The devil always starts by trying to put a question in your mind. Yeah, that's right. Good. He'll never start out with, eat the fruit and die. That's not where he goes. He'll start out with, yeah, but, I mean, come on. <clears throat> Science is telling us yeah, that we're ahead. like trillions of years into this go thing. Ahead. And they'll throw out stats and figures, and they'll throw out years like we throw out, you know, a piece of candy. And you start to think, well, I mean, scientifically speaking, there's nothing wrong with science as long as it doesn't go against the Bible. Right. Yeah, true. Yeah. But Satan puts a question in there. He said, "Have God said?" He just got. By the way, and the biggest problem was they're dialoguing with the devil. You don't dialogue with the devil. Yes, sir. That's why you get on the internet and just search and scope and go and all that. You're out your mind. You think Satan doesn't know that? Let me tell you what's the biggest antichrist on the internet. It's called Pinterest. That's right. Pinterest. It's some site my wife told me to go to because we wanted to paint a bathroom. <laughs> you go there, honey, and you look at it, and it will show you different colors for the bathroom. Now, ladies, look at me. We see in like black and white, maybe red. We don't know what in the world mauve is. <laughs> and peach is a fruit. Amen. And she says, go on there and look in there. So I thought, okay. I go to look at colors in a bathroom. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. Hour later, I'm looking at blue jean frogs in the Amazon. <laughs> and how in the world I got over there? How do you go from the bathroom to the Amazon? <laughs> From toilets to blue jean frogs. What? And after a minute, I went, what? Wait a minute. I forgot what color it was. Haven't touched it since then. And I, no, no, that's wicked, man. You say Pinterest is not bad, Brother Johnson. It's how you use it. Yeah, YouTube's probably not bad. It's how you use it. TikTok's probably not bad. I don't know. I don't do any of that stuff. I don't know. But that, you know what? It's, it's amazing how all of a sudden that becomes your master. Right. Come on, come on. Sitting at the little Joe. Sitting at the table and hear people talk. What do they talk about? Movies. Yep. Athletes. God help you if one of them is Taylor Swift. Go ahead. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. She's a hoe. I ain't talking right. no garden tools, Becky. You. you got that? <laughs> it's fascinating. You listen to people's conversations. They say great minds talk about ideas. Small minds talk about people. Yeah. Well, did you hear what they said? Did you see what they posted? And then we got people who are stupid enough to post stuff about themselves, pictures of themselves on the internet, and they go, oh, shouldn't have done it. <laughs> Too bad. <laughs> you done bit it off, pal. Tanner, sit up, son. The truth of the matter is, look, you just drank a Red Bull, so, you know, you should be buzzing. The truth of the matter is, look at me. The truth is, see, you say, well, that's not like a master. Does it own you? Does it run your life? Yeah, is now. it your authority? Get on that. Now, I just decided a long time ago after the hippie from the 60s and all the foolishness that they told us was important, I'll take Jesus. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, quickly. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Oh, you'll love this one. This, this one's going to make you feel good about yourself. But that's what's important is feeling good about yourself. Oh, yeah. you got to feel good about yourself. If you don't feel good about yourself, I mean, they're actually telling us that people who commit crimes... The issue is a bad self-image. No, the issue is they've defiled their conscience so badly. Yep. There's five consciences in the Bible. You start with a good conscience. That's the one you got at birth. 
But if you keep violating that conscience, eventually it is transformed, number five, into an evil conscience. That's how people cut up body parts and eat them and store them in their freezer and commit horrible crimes against people. You say, well, they got a bad self-image. No, they got a defiled conscience. They got a conscience that's corrupted from the wickedness they've lived by their lives. Self-image is not the issue. It's not part of the plan, but let me throw it out there because it, maybe this will help you. This idea of anorexia and bulimia, cutting yourself, burning yourself, this kind of stuff. See, when I was a kid, we didn't cut ourselves. We cut other people. Well, there's another subject. <laughs> but there are people who are doing this now, and I'm thinking, whoa, whoa, whoa. Well, someone told me I was fat, so I'm going to starve myself to death. No, 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 no. This will fly in the face of Sigmund Freud, Skinner Rogers, and the rest of the boys. Let me tell you what that comes from. Listen to me. It comes from selfishness. You think too much about what other people think about you. If you weren't so self-possessed, you wouldn't do that. I know that sounds terrible. And believe me, I got, I've worked with teenagers and talked to kids and stuff before. I mean, they cut themselves. With knives, not enough to bleed out, just enough to score their flesh. They burn themselves. Yeah. They starve themselves to death. Come on. Walking skeletons. Yeah. And you say, well, Brother Johnson, their problem is bad self-image. No, their problem is there's too much self in their thinking. That's right. Yeah. I don't care. Now, watch me. This will help you. I don't care what you think about me. I don't care if you think I'm too old, too fat. I'm not too fat. <laughs> hey. 14 verses on fat in the Bible, not one on being skinny. Check it out. I, I did have to lose weight about five years when I was about 330 pounds. And I got notice from the post office if I didn't lose weight, they would have to do another zip code to my city, so I had to do something about that. I had more chins in a Chinese phone book. I was wearing an X-Game t-shirt, stepped outside, helicopters trying to land on my back. My wife was using a driveway for an ironing board. I was down by the ocean, a killer whale jumped, a kid took a picture, it looked like a Tic Tac going by. I mean, it was that bad. I mean, Walmart, my phone beeped, a woman grabbed two kids and said, watch out, he's backing up! I mean, it was bad. People were using me for shade. I mean... <laughs> Fell down the hallway one night, rocked myself to sleep before I could get back up. I mean, uh, 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 uh. had a watch on each arm because each arm was in a different time zone. I get out of bed both sides same time. <laughs> Try to get a family photo. They said, "Sorry, we don't do aerial photographs." You know. Say, well, then why did you? And I did a lot. I've lost about 70, 80 pounds now. The truth of the matter is, why did you do that? So you can feel good about yourself. No, I'm old, and you can't be old and fat. It's not good for you. But the truth of the matter is, I don't care whether you like how I look. I don't care whether I match your idea of what a person should look like. You shouldn't either. Yeah. Yes. We're too caught up in what others think about us. That's all self stuff. Okay, that didn't go over too good. All right. Thank you. But you can fix it really simply. Yeah. Stop getting hung up on whether, well, if you ever tell a kid they're fat, boy, you could, well, don't do that, number one. That's not your business. Shut your mouth. Thank you. Yeah. But number two, if someone does, <laughs> water off a duck's back. Thank you. And Come stop, that's, that's, we do it. We say, I'm not spending enough time on this, am I? No. Some of you are looking at me like, this guy doesn't get it. No, you don't get it. That's right. Yeah. Come on. Oh, here's what we do. Oh, I love your hair. You actually love the hair. You love it. I just love the way you, you're standing there. You love it? <laughs> Come on. Really? <clears throat> so I'm walking into the mall. These kids hanging around the front of the mall, right? Got the pants pulled down, the little Spider-Man panties sticking out there. <laughs> Got a hat on, turned sideways. Even a duck knows which way the bill's supposed to go, okay? <laughs> And they're standing there, and I, I started walking them all. Here's a kid, flashing gang signs. And I said, Oh, poor dude's got cerebral palsy. <laughs> so I walked over to him, and I took my tracks out of my pocket, and he stuck up. I said, Hey, pal, I'd like to leave you this track. No, man. No. Church boring, man. I said, Really? Really? So what are you doing, Spanky? <laughs> well, I hang with my pee. No. Hang with my pee. Really? So your uh, your excitement is holding up the wall in this mall. 
That's it? Yeah, yeah, the church is boring now. You have to understand, I got a terminal case of sarcasm. I, just, I said, well, Spanky, I don't mean to take you from your exciting life. But what if you get done picking fuzz out your belly button and then a sweater for your grandma? Why don't you come to church sometime and see what real life is all about? He never came. I don't understand that. <laughs> but the truth is, it's fascinating to me. People, people get caught up in, oh, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. That's enough on that other stuff because, you know, I'm not a psychologist. Thank God. Woo! Verse 9, 1 Corinthians 4. For I think that God uh, hath set forth us the apostles last, as we were appointed to death, for we are made a spectacle. That means they're watching the world. That's the system out there by Satan. Angels, angelic hosts, and men. That's just anybody on the planet. But verse 10 is the key. We are fools for Christ's sake. Don't you love to look like a fool? I mean, isn't it just, man, I hope today... I make a total fool out of myself. We are fools for Christ's sake. But ye are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. Ye are honorable, but we are despised. Incontrovertible truth number three. Everyone is a fool. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Everyone is. Yeah. Fool doesn't mean stupid. Fool means you know what's right and you choose to do what's wrong. Yeah. Oh. Or better said, you know what's acceptable and approved, and you choose to go against that. Because when you're, look here, you're either a fool for Jesus, or you're a fool in this world, one or the other. This world's going to think you are absolutely outside your cotton picking mind. That boy in the mall that day, <laughs> he looked at me like, that old man doesn't know what he's doing. I'm saying, this kid hasn't got enough sense to pull his britches up so his underwear ain't sticking out. And they get it down by their knees... <laughs> and this is cool. What if you have to hurry up and get to the bathroom? You're dead, Jack. <laughs> Sit up, buddy. Don't lean up. Sit up. There you go, good man. You know, <laughs> there are times that we do things and the work. You get on a bus route, you look like a fool on a Saturday. If you're not working and serving in your church on a bus route, children's ministry, some kind of service of ministry in your church, can I ask you a question? What, what are you doing? Yes. Hello, what, what are you doing? Well, I can't get up that early on a Saturday. <laughs> 9 30, 10 o'clock in the morning. Well, if you turn your stupid television set off, get off your video game, you can get your rusty backside up out of bed in time to go over and get on a bus route, but you're going to look like a fool. <laughs> Around here, Dead of winter. I've had folks from BBC send me a picture of them door knocking at 30 below. Yes. With a moose out in the front yard munching on a tree bark. Yep. Do you look stupid or what? <laughs> you don't look stupid to Jesus. Right. Yeah. Right. And you don't look stupid to the people you're trying to help. Yeah. Yep. But you see, that's embarrassing. Yeah. Because what are, what are people going to think about me? What are they going to say? See, again, look at me. Too much self. No, 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 no. You are somebody's fool. Either God's fool or the devil's. One or the other one. And he's going to make a fool out of you. The devil will make a fool out of you. And he will like it when he does. He'll entice you. He never makes you sin. You choose. But he'll entice you. And then you take it. And then he'll beat you over the head with it. And then he'll run your nose in it and make you look like a fool when it's all over and said and done. And walk off and leave the sucked out carcass of your life there. I was cleaning the garage one day with my wife and we we're sweeping under some stuff. And I swept out a, a hollowed out carcass of a wolf spider. It, I mean, something had it hanging from a web and something had taken that thing and sucked everything out of it. It was just a shell. And I pulled it out and I picked it up and I go, honey, look at that. She goes, that's disgusting! And I said, babe... What's disgusting is whatever got that dude's in here somewhere. <laughs> I cleaned the garage by myself the rest of the day because I couldn't find the spider that got the big spider. <laughs> you know, the truth is, people, I'm sorry. That's what the devil does. He sucked the life right out of you. That's right. And why would he want to mess with an old dude like me who doesn't have much time left? But he still does, by the way. Come on. Oh, you. Your prime target. Yeah. Yeah. And if he can get you to think that you're not making a fool out of yourself, he can draw you in long enough and he'll make a fool out of you. Yes. Yeah. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. One more and we're done. Galatians 6 and verse 7. You know it. 
be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Mm -hmm. Incontrovertible truth. Number next. Last one. Everybody sows and everybody reaps. Everyone sows and everyone reaps. Well, I'm not doing, uh, look at me. You say, well, I'm not doing anything. Then you're sowing nothing. Guess what you reap from that? Nothing. Yeah. Or that stuff that you think that nobody else knows about it. You put that seed in the ground. That's coming back. Amazing forgiveness of God. I mean, it is incredible to me that he is so willing to be faithful and just to forgive us our sins. It's just amazing to me that he'll forgive us. But we think forgiveness means he wipes the slate clean and nothing comes out of that. No, that's not the case. There's a man who ran the rescue mission in First Baptist Hammond when I was in Bible college there. Brother, Brother Sully. And he got to, when he was younger days, he got the realm of the mafia in Chicago. Not a good idea, by the way. He crossed them up and they went after him and he ran, literally ran to the other side of the world in Australia. He thought after several years he'd gotten away from them. It wasn't a problem. He went to, stepped out of a hotel one day, grabbed a doorknob, went to open it, and it blew up and blew his arm off. Sometime later, he was living on the streets in Hammond, Indiana, and he staggered into a rescue mission, trusted Christ, and got saved. Brother Sully then became the director of that rescue mission and helped dozens of men, tremendous man. No arm. God didn't put his arm back on him. You know, God will forgive you for doing wrong. But you're still going to reap what you sow. Yeah. But remember the principle. Now listen. You sow to the flesh. Of the flesh you reap corruption. But it also says this. You sow to the spirit. Of the spirit you reap life everlasting. Mm -hmm. Oh. Wait. Wait. So there's good seed I put in the ground. So let's say you've been sowing the wrong stuff. You know what you do? Stop. Start putting the right stuff in your Amen. life. Amen. And let the harvest pass each other. But they will have to pass. Right. I was out of the will of God for 10 years of my life. From the time I was 12 till I was 22 years old. And God got a hold of my heart and life. I told you about that yesterday with my wife-to-be and all that stuff that happened. I got right with God. I got in. But you know that 10 years, my teenage years and all that stuff, not only was it gone, there was stuff in that teenage years that I still, I was sitting there today reading my Bible, praying for the meeting tonight, and stuff came to mind when I was a teenager. Yeah, and It's still in there. Yeah. I dismissed it, went on, but it's still there. That's a couple years ago. So don't think because the forgiveness of God is so freely available that you can just do whatever you want and nothing's going to come of that. Something will always come of that. Yeah. James chapter 1. Sin, when it is finished, bring us forth. Look here. Stand up your kneecaps on your, on your knee. Don't no, no sit on your kneecaps. Watch it. There's a point where you control sin and sin controls you. And you, there comes a time, watch me, where they cross. And you know where that is? Nobody knows. Because if you knew where it was, well, I can do this for six months and then I'll give it up. No, no, it never works like that. I know people are living under a bridge with a plastic bag for a, for a uh, jacket talking on an Obama phone. And they still think they're in control of their drugs and alcohol. They don't get it. There's a, t there's a point where sin, when it is fit, sin takes over and it takes control. You don't, get to, you don't get to see that moment. And then it runs your life. And when it's done, death comes. Not just physical death, spiritual. Things start to, you lose stuff. However, those 10 years I lost outside the will of God because of my foolishness have now been buried by over 55, 60 years, 50 years of living for God. And friend, let me tell you something. That harvest is coming in regularly. We worked on our, our garden. We got our garden in and all that stuff. My wife sent me a picture today. She just picked the first squash off our squash plant. Now, if you don't like squash, it's because you're a Yankee and you're probably not going to heaven. Go but <laughs> she makes squash, yellow and zucchini squash, steams it, mashes it, covers it in cheese, and ruffles potato chips, toasts it a little bit. That must have been man. Close. <laughs> if not, it was a fried okra. But you, hey, again, you Yankees know what you're saying. Go ahead. The truth of the matter is that first squash has already come in. We've only been there for like, put it in like four weeks ago. But I go out, look at my garden, check the stuff, see how it goes. You say, boy, how boring is that? How boring are you sitting there looking at the internet for hours? Yeah. Yeah. You got no life, broski. Right. Yeah. 
or sister ski? Come on. <laughs> you got seriously. It's true. Come on. No, 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 no. Unfortunately, you ask the average teenager, how's it going? You know what they'll say? Bored. I'm bored. This is boring. Yeah, Let me right. tell you why your life gets to be boring. Because you're boring. That's right. Come on. Would God I had time to get bored. I would love to get bored. That would be fantastic. I just don't have time to do that right now. And now I'm retired as a pastor. I'm, I'm traveling, traveling, doing stuff more now than I did as a pastor even. And I wasn't standing around then. But the truth of the matter is, woo, I got a life. And if it ends tonight, all good. So if I drive home tonight and I hit one of those, what? And I go off into a swamp somewhere and I get eaten by a grizz. <laughs> I will have the last thing I did was preach the word of God Amen. before I kicked off. How would you like it yeah. if the trump of God sounds and you go up and you're trying to grab your controller while you're going? You say, no, 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 not my phone. <laughs> we're all sowing and we're all going to reap. So let's just go ahead and put the right stuff in the ground. Yeah. Give it time. <laughs> And God comes through. Heads bowed, eyes closed, please. <coughs> so then can we can we just come to a realization tonight? It's very simple. That we are going to face God one day, and let's live our lives to prepare for that day. You're not, you're not trying to live right so you can face God. You want to live right so you're not be ashamed when you face God. 